Okay, so for our final session of this segment, uh, before we have a break, uh, we have Rachel White uh, from Datadog, who's going to talk to us about how to bring networked art from the browser to your wall. Now, unfortunately, Rachel can't be here live today, but she did send us a recording of the presentation, so we're going to do a replay of that presentation here. But to give you a little bit of background, Rachel White is a technologist, artist, and pretend cyborg who is currently a technical evangelist at Datadog and a member of the Node.js community committee. She's interested in new uses for old hardware, useless robots, VR, AR, MR, and bots. She has spoken internationally about Node.js, JavaScript, creative coding, IoT, artificial intelligence, node bots, and hardware. Previously, she's worked at Adobe, IBM, and Microsoft, and also was an artist in residence at Pioneer Works, where she worked on a series that visualized what modern cybernetic augmentation could look like with today's hardware and special effects makeup. So with that, we will go to Rachel's presentation. Thank you. Apologize in advance for not doing this live. Time zones are a hassle. Hopefully next time this happens, I'll be able to be a live speaker for you. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about networked art from the browser to your wall. My name is Rachel White, and I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog. JavaScript and Node is my specialty, so most of the projects I work on pertain to those areas. I'm Oho on Twitter if you want to follow me, but I post more about cats and reality television than I do about programming often. I'm also on the Node.js community committee where we work on initiatives that are important to the community members, such as educational outreach, diversity and inclusivity work, internationalization efforts, and a ton more. So if you're interested in contributing to open source or wanting to get involved, please reach out to me and let me know. I'm a programmer, an artist, and a maker. Um, I have entirely way too many hobbies, and I try and incorporate all of them into the work that I do. I also just really love teaching people new things. I'd like to tell you about some of my previous work today that I've done to kind of give you a better idea of who I am through my code and the way that I like to teach people with code. RoboKitty was my first Node.js and first hardware project that I worked on five years ago in 2015. For the project, I used a particle photon connected to a continuous servo that I glued to the dispenser handle of a serial dispenser. The way you activated the sensor was via a Node app on the same network as the photon. So you'd go to a website, push a button, dispense some food for your pets in case you were too lazy to get up. Um, it was extremely simple to execute, and the talks that I gave on it detailed the struggles that I have encountered while trying something new, and also an extremely verbose README so that anyone who wanted to get started with the project could follow along, whether or not they had ever written a line of code or not. The next project I want to show you is a Twitter bot that I made called Magical and Cute. It's currently offline, unfortunately, so don't try it out because it won't work. Um, Twitter deprecated a lot of their API stuff a few years ago, and it was a little bit difficult to get bots up and running as it used to be. Magical and Cute is an application that uses Twit, which is a Twitter API client for Node. It also uses Microsoft's Face API, and when people tweeted selfies of the bot, it would ping the Face API which returns an object full of XY coordinates of landmarks on the face. Then, using graphics magic, I iterate through the eyes, uh, cheeks, and lips with some very magical math and overlay some custom cute little animal ears and cheeks and noses that I drew, and it then tweets it back to the person. 
Um, I did this project for a couple of reasons. People, people are really into Twitter bots, but they're also generally afraid of facial recognition. And so I wanted to teach people to understand how some facial recognition APIs work while also teaching you how to make your own Twitter bot. The barrier to a lot of things people keep themselves from trying is fear, so I try and explain things as best as I can to educate people so that they won't be afraid to try. So hopefully it's obvious by those projects what my intentions are when it comes to working on things that I'm going to release out into the community. I don't necessarily tend to focus on building libraries that people can use or contribute to a lot of core uh, open source projects. I just like to pick interesting and engaging projects that take Node or some other cool stuff that people have already built and create a fun story around it to educate and entertain people. I like to talk about the mistakes that I've made and the things that I could have done better because that whole process is extremely important to me as well when it comes to humanizing us as developers. I gave a keynote at a conference called Node Interactive a while back about how creative coding is the best way, in my opinion, to bring new people from other languages or who are totally new to programming into programming because it's easier for people to relate to a fun project than necessarily a real world use case if they're unfamiliar with a certain technology. So that's what I'd like to do. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, secure IoT communications and uh, you know, device to cloud, app to cloud, lots of cloud stuff. Um, hopefully you enjoy it as much as I did putting it together. Today, we're gonna talk about a project that I did called Tiny Gallery. Tiny Gallery is a pixel art gallery. Um, I really love pixel art and I also love bright, pretty lights, which tends to get people's attention and they want to pay attention when you show them pretty lights. Um, so I decided I wanted to make a pixel art gallery for you to keep in your home. I wanted it to utilize some really great features of Azure, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And I also wanted users to be able to upload their own images to be able to display those as well. Um, I needed it to be semi-secure um, since I'm not too great with security stuff. I wanted to try and protect myself a little bit from like code injection and whatever else people would try and do with an image form. Uh, I originally wanted it to do live drawing, but I'm lazy and I figured just displaying a GIF would be enough. So uh, let's get into some of the more technical aspects of it. For the hardware, I used a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. Um, I'd only worked with a Pi once previously, uh, and I was really intimidated for a while because um, I was like, oh, I need a keyboard and a mouse to like do this easy, and I thought it was super difficult um, when in all actuality, it's really not. Um, I found this really great software called Pi Bakery, which allows you to provision your memory card with uh, you know, being able to set up the Wi-Fi access on first boot. It lets you enable VNC so that you can remote into it. You don't have to worry about needing a mouse and a keyboard. You can just uh, flash the card with all this information, put it into your Raspberry Pi, and as soon as it boots up, you'll be able to access it remotely from your own laptop, which is really great. Uh, the other hardware that I'm using is a 32 by 32 LED matrix panel. I got mine from Adafruit. And they can be daisy chained into larger panels, which is really cool. So it doesn't necessarily just need to be 32 by 32. It's expandable for however much processing power you, you need. Um, these are essentially what you see when you're looking up at big electronic billboards, but on a uh, much smaller scale because we're only using one and not like hundreds of them. Luckily, the hardware part of this project is mostly the easy part. The panel itself requires a five volt power supply. So the only soldering that you'll have to do is attaching the right kind of adapter for your power supply. For powering the LEDs, a single LED panel needs 13 IO lines, which fit all in the header of the old Raspberry Pis. The newer Raspberry Pis have 40 pins um, and they have more GPIO lines, which allows you to connect three parallel chains of RGB panels. Since we're only using one panel today, that means we only you know, have to hook it up once and don't need to use all those extra pins. And there's only one power supply, so making it a little bit easier on everyone. 
we're going to start out with talking about the Pi application. Um, so basically, I love to write fun, lazy code that gets the job done. Uh, one good thing about being an evangelist is we pick our own projects and we're not writing production code. So we basically get to make all of the decisions. Um, and since the Raspberry Pi is the one that is powering the LED matrix, we've got to write some stuff that runs the panel. But there's a problem. There is no node library for the LED matrix, which is the language or the library that I primarily work with. Um, there's a couple, but they're out of date. Nobody's maintained them, um, and they don't do exactly what you need to do. So I'm using a C++ library uh, called Raspberry Pi, or it's RPi RGB LED matrix. And I'm making calls to it using a package called node CMD that allows you to use run commands as if you were typing it yourself in the terminal. Um, the way that I'm handling the files and passing them around makes me comfortable with running it so like, I don't know, put together with sticks because nothing that's being sent over IoT Hub or being pulled down from the file share is nameable or controllable by the user. So, you know, just running simple commands that are telling the display to show the GIF for, I believe, five seconds. The web part of the application is your basic Node.js application. I'm using Express for the routing, EJS for the templating, Socket.io for real-time communications, and jQuery because this is just a quick, simple project and I wanted to keep it easy and simple. Uh, there's a bit more going on under the hood, but we'll talk about that when we get to the code. I'm also using jQuery because I can, and <laughs> it's easy. Another huge part of the project is reliant on some Azure services that I'm going to give you a brief overview of. We'll be using IoT Hub, File Service, and Azure App Services. We're using the IoT Hub for communication between the web application and the Raspberry Pi. When an image is selected from the web gallery, it pings the IoT Hub, which notifies the Raspberry Pi that there's an image ready to pull down from the storage and display. Uh, IoT Hub is a managed service. It's hosted in the cloud. It acts as a central message hub for bi-directional communication between your IoT application and the devices it manages. So you can use it to build IoT solutions with reliable and secure communications between millions of IoT devices and a cloud-hosted solution backend. You can basically connect whatever you want to IoT Hub. Um, it supports communications from the device to the cloud, from the cloud to the device, uh, and multiple messaging patterns such as device to cloud telemetry, file upload from devices, request reply methods to control your devices from the cloud. It also allows us to have a more secure connection as each device is authenticated with the system. So when the hub is getting messages from me, it knows it's me and not like some other random website that would have my credentials or something like that. Um, and the free tier is great because it's good for hobby projects like this if you want to play around with it. And then Azure File Storage is what we're using for all of our, all of our pixel art, uh, specifically the blob storage, which is optimized for storing massive amounts of unstructured data. Unstructured data is data that doesn't adhere to a particular data model or definition, such as text or binary data. It's designed for serving images or documents directly to the browser, which is our use case, which is great. Um, storing files for distributed access, streaming video and audio, writing to log files, and storing data for backup and restore, disaster recovery, archiving, all that kind of stuff. There's also a Node SDK for it, which makes it very straightforward to work with. So um, it was pretty easy to get up and use, and you will see it soon. And finally, we're hosting the site on Azure's web app service. It's an HTTP-based service for hosting web applications, REST APIs, and mobile backends. You can develop in whatever language you want, .NET, .NET Core, Java, Ruby, Node.js, PHP, Python, you name it. Uh, and there's a quick deployment with, with VS Code. Once you connect to Azure, it's a single button. 
which makes things a lot easier. I also wanted a better way to keep an eye on my Raspberry Pi. And something new that Datadog offers is our IoT agent. The IoT agent is a lightweight version of the standard Datadog agent that takes up fewer resources while still providing full visibility into your devices by automatically collecting over 100 health metrics and application logs. You can install with a single command, and it's beneficial, especially for those who are needing to watch a large number of devices and services. Um, this way, you can quickly determine if an issue is called, caused by a malfunctioning device, connection is issues between devices and the cloud, or performances of backend services. It's really great for me because I'm not going to be constantly remoted into my Pi, so I need a way to make sure things are running as they should be. And this gives me the insight to be able to do that. It was very straightforward for me to set up a monitor to alert me if my Raspberry Pi has been unresponsive. So I'm able to check and see what's going on. Maybe if my cat knocked it off the table and the power cord fell off or something like that. So I set up a new monitor on Datadog to watch my Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can see since I have the agent installed, my host option is already completed for me and I'm able to grab that Raspberry Pi right there. Um, so I'm going to have a check alert set up so that it'll allow me to know if the Pi stops responding. And I don't think too many people are going to be interacting with my device. So I changed the response time to 10 minutes. Um, our messaging template allows you to write messages using template variables, which um, make it specific to the metrics you're following. So you can see I am watching for the host. And if there's no response, I'm going to set up an email here to me to let me know that the Pi has stopped responding, which is great. And you can get way more in depth with this to specific services. Clearly, for my small purpose, I'm just trying to make sure it's, you know, still alive and kicking. Okay, so now let's take a look at the code and see a demo of the application. All right, so like I said a few times already, uh, I do things my way. And so this is, you know, just a personal application. Obviously, things could be written a lot better. Basically, all I care about is that you grasp the key concepts that I'm trying to teach you today and can take it home and then, you know, learn from there and try and build some things yourself or, you know, help scale something that you're working on at your company, something along the lines of that. So here's the code. Um, this is the um, app.js that is running our Azure App Services web application. And so up here at the top, we're requiring in .env, which loads the environment variables from an env file into process.env. And this is where I'm going to store important information, such as my IoT connection string and my Azure storage connection string. So Azure IoT Hub is Microsoft's Azure IoT Service SDK for Node.js. And Azure IoT Common is a internal library of components shared between the Azure IoT service and service SDKs. Azure Storage is the SDK for Node.js. And then you'll notice some other commonly used packages up here, such as Express and Socket IO. And then right here, I am setting a variable that is the base URL for what my images will be. I grabbed this from the Azure File Storage dashboard. And um, you can grab it there. You just log in and you name things what you want, obviously, because you then grab it there. And then I'm setting my view engine to EJS and making Express use the public folder for static files, which is, you know, also common. And then right here, we are connecting to uh, Azure File Storage, pulling down the images that already exist and displaying them in our template. Then here we're setting up the socket connection between the Raspberry Pi and the web application and setting up some console logs on error and success so we know how things are happening the way that we want them to. And the IoT connection string is how we know that our devices are communicating securely. 
Lastly, we're setting up the upload form, which is when an image is added to the blob service, it first looks to see if the container that we're wanting to use exists. If it doesn't, we create it. And then we're temporarily saving the image locally when sending it up to the blob service. And once we know it's successfully been saved, we remove the local copy. And that's doing most of the heavy lifting. Um, and I'll give you a peek at the uglier code <laughs> and briefly uh, explain how that's working. So over here in PixJS, my comment, hi, don't judge me. Um, my browser code is all just socket functions to allow communication from client to the server, um, and as well as jQuery to handle displaying images and part of the form. So what it's doing is it is um, showing the art in the mini gallery on the web page while simultaneously set letting the server know to send a message via the IoT hub so that the Pi can display it. And then lastly, which is the roughest of them all, <laughs> is the Raspberry Pi code. Um, we're using the same Azure IoT device library so that we can handle the messages and the Azure IoT device MQTT library, which lets us communicate with Azure IoT hub from any device over MQTT. And then I mentioned this before, but node command is the package that allows me to run terminal commands so that I can use the C++ library also installed on the Pi, um, which is what we use to display the images. And this is obviously a really messy way to do it, but it's what worked out for me. And then we just make sure that we can connect to the IoT hub and um, open a socket listening for messages coming through. And once it gets the message, we send it on up to the Pi. And that's the code. All right, and now it is the moment that you have all been waiting for. We can actually see how it works in action. All right, so the Raspberry Pi is behind this LED panel. It's a hot mess. Ignore the little light there. Uh, not connected to the laptop whatsoever. Um, I have the web application running and you can see the images that have been pulled down from Azure File Service. And when you click on it, it is sending that message over to the Pi and the Pi is grabbing it down from File Service and displaying it. A little bright, which is one thing. It's hard to film LEDs, but looks great. Thanks. Yeah, so that's that's it for me. I hope that you learned a lot of fun stuff that you can take home and try things out. Uh, my name, like, once again, is Rachel White. I am Oho on Twitter. If you want to try out our IoT agent, you can try Datadog for free for 14 days. And all of the code for my repository is on my GitHub at github.com slash Rachel Nicole slash Pi Gallery. Thanks.